We're going to get started here. I'm Sharon Swassoni, and I direct the Proliferation and Prevention Program here at CSIS. And I'm very pleased um, that you could join us here today. The focus of our program is generally nuclear related, so I'm especially pleased um, to be able to branch out a bit today and host this luncheon for His Excellency Ahmad Uzumchu. Have I pronounced yeah, your name? Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, before I begin introductions, I'd like to just make a few administrative notes. Um, this event is streaming live, uh, and it's on the record. So please, please turn your cell phone ringers off <laughs> out of respect for um, everybody here. We're going to leave plenty of time for questions uh, from participants. And uh, just when the time comes, I ask that you introduce yourself and your organization and keep your comment or question brief. So we're quite honored here uh, today to have Ahmad Uzumchu. He was appointed Director General of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in December of 2009, and he began his term in July of 2010. He has a long, distinguished career in the Turkish diplomatic corps, both in the Middle East and Europe. He's represented uh, Turkey as the permanent representative to the UN office in Geneva at NATO at the Conference on Disarmament. Uh, he was ambassador to Israel from 1999 to 2002, has served in Vienna, and was a consul in Aleppo, Syria in the 1980s. I can't imagine a better background <laughs> uh, for your current job. We have a lot to talk about today. Uh, the OPCW just um, completed its third five-year review conference, um, and Mr. Zimchu has just returned from site visits in the U.S., and of course, um, Syria is on everybody's mind uh, with the allegations of chemical weapons use. So I give the floor over to you, sir. Thank you, Sharon. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. I, I want to thank all those who are attending today. Um, I think uh, this is an opportunity for me, uh, in fact, to share my thoughts about the current state of affairs at the OPCW. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, we'll discuss uh, uh, the situation in Syria with regard to chemical weapons and other issues. And uh, I will also speak briefly about the uh, outcome of the review conference that we, in fact, had uh, uh, a month ago. Um, I believe that the passage of time only confirms that uh, international treaties and agreements freely negotiated and accepted are indeed an effective means uh, to establish a system of uh, global governance uh, based on shared values, objectives, and responsibilities. Even in an area of complex, uh, as complex as international security, uh, the example of the Chemical Weapons Convention strongly confirms uh, the validity of multilateralism uh, in dealing with uh, uh, those challenges. And uh, in fact, the OPCW has been uh, shown as a, a good example of effective multilateralism uh, over the years. Uh, we have recently concluded an important event uh, in the history of the OPCW, the third review conference, uh, the review conferences to uh, actually uh, uh, are being held every five years. And this was, uh, was particularly uh, significant because it took place against the background of a major transition uh, for the organization. Uh, and Syria, of course, was one of the topics that uh, has been addressed uh, during the conference. Uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, the conference ended successfully, uh, providing a much needed boost to our work, uh, even if, uh, as we know that challenges uh, lie ahead. Uh, set up in 1997, the organization has enjoyed 16 uh, productive and fruitful years. The most visible and accountable of its accomplishments uh, was the destruction uh, under international verification uh, of the declared stockpiles of chemical weapons. The convention, in fact, represents uh, a first in the history of disarmament and non-proliferation of uh, WMDs, as no comparative regimes exist in the area of uh, nuclear or biological. Uh, the unique features of the Convention are its balance of rights and obligations and a robust system of verification. The key to our success has been the ability of the OPCW to demonstrate how a complete ban on an entire category of WMDs can in fact be implemented in practice. Our work represents several dimensions, 
verification provides the basis of uh, confidence in the effectiveness of the treaty. At the same time, assists and protection against chemical weapons and international cooperation for peaceful users of chemistry address the expectations of our diverse clientele. Membership of the convention has expanded rapidly to 188 states parties. Only eight countries uh, have yet to join it. Verification of destruction uh, of uh, declared chemical weapons has thus far been the major focus of our work. 80% uh, of those chemical weapons have already been destroyed. The United States has reached the level of 90%. Russian Federation uh, uh, is the other major processor state. Uh, both uh, these uh, states uh, pro uh, make steady progress towards uh, complete destruction. Their commitment uh, to eliminating chemical weapons deserves full acknowledgement and praise. In fact, my presence in the US on this occasion is an account of a visit by the members of the Executive Council uh, of the OPSW to the two sites, in, uh, one in Pueblo, Colorado, and the other one in Bluegrass, Kentucky, <coughs> which are under uh, construction at the moment. And the members of the council are here to acquire a better understanding of the US efforts to completely destroy uh, its chemical weapons. And transparency also leads to an appreciation of the uh, genuine constraints that have prevented the US, as well as Russia, uh, to complete the task by the final deadline, which was uh, expired, in fact, uh, on 29th April last year. Uh, the Russian Federation also hosts uh, similar visits every two years. On the whole, we are today on the verge of <coughs> reaching global zero on chemical <coughs> weapons. Uh, touching that milestone will be a momentous occasion, we hope, in the next five, six years. This would mark the first time in our history that an entire category of WMDs gets eliminated verifiably. While this would obviously be a cause for celebration, it also naturally raises certain questions about the future of the regime in the post-destruction phase. These questions concern our emerging priorities, if not about the uh, very relevance of the treaty to our future security needs. Uh, my response to these issues is quite emphatic. All threats have not disappeared. The convention is not yet universal. The prohibition on chemical weapons does not lapse with elimination of declared chemical weapons or even after the possibly non-declared ones have also been eliminated. The organization uh, will continue to remain responsible for ensuring that chemical weapons will never re-emerge. In other words, the non-proliferation function will outlive disarmament. If anything, in the face of the challenges we face, we need to redouble our efforts to strengthen the prohibition on chemical weapons globally in order to attain a world that's free from chemical weapons. This requires, of course, continued hard work on, and international cooperation if we take the case of Syria, um, it made a startling, uh, this country made a startling near admission uh, last year about possession of chemical weapons. This was followed by allegations of use uh, of CWs on its territory. States parties to the convention have expressed their deep concern that chemical weapons may have been used in Syria. And they are underlined that the use of chemical weapons by anyone under any circumstances would be reprehensible and completely contrary to the legal norms and standards of the international community. They have also expressed their support for the cooperation in accordance with the convention between the OPSW and the United Nations in the context of investigation of alleged use of chemical weapons. As you know, the Secretary General uh, has authorized an investigation in Syria uh, that initially involved a request by the Syrian government followed by two other requests from other member states to investigate additional uh, incidents. Subsequently, uh, the modalities for an investigation could not be agreed between the UN and Syria. The OPSW uh, appears to be the only international body uh, that has the capability to conduct a credible investigation of alleged use of chemical weapons. And we maintain our readiness to do so by continually investing in and testing our preparedness. However, as Syria is not a state party to the convention, the OPSW does not have the legal ability, authority to conduct any verification activities in that country on its own. 
Uh, therefore, in accordance with our standing arrangements with the United Nations, which go back to the year 2000, we have a relationship agreement uh, between the two organizations. And uh, we have also a specific provision in our uh, convention, uh, according to which uh, the OPCW has the obligation to put uh, uh, at the disposal of the U.S. Secretary General, if he requests, uh, its resources for a, a fact-finding mission uh, within the context of uh, an alleged use. Um, and uh, in this context, we responded positively, of course, to the U.S. Secretary General's request, and a group of uh, 15 OPCW experts <coughs> uh, have been made available, and they are still on standby. Uh, we had an advanced team for a while, uh, actually for almost a month in Cyprus, uh, uh, that we actually withdrew uh, recently. Um, in the past, the OPCW has made several demarches uh, to states not party uh, in order to <coughs> uh, convince them for their accessions. Uh, this includes uh, Syria. Uh, and uh, I recently wrote also, I mean recently, last November, uh, to the Syrian foreign minister, uh, urging his government to join the convention. And this was followed by a joint letter uh, between myself and uh, the uh, UN Secretary General. Uh, we sent uh, jointly signed letters to the eight, eight heads of state and government, uh, uh, requesting them to uh, join the convention uh, without further delay. Uh, when the OPCW was allowed to, to conduct this work, uh, the results have been generally positive. This is evident in the case of Libya. Uh, a state party which to experience the severe international internal conflict and is now happily on the road of, to a new future. Uh, despite the serious difficulties that we encountered due to turmoil in Libya, uh, working closely with this government, the new government, and with the vital cooperation and support by a number of state parties, including the United States, we are on track in soon closing the chapter on Libya's uh, chemical weapons. Uh, just as the situation in Syria requires the cooperation of the members of the UN, uh, the universality of the Convention can also benefit from efforts of countries uh, that enjoy good relations with the concerned states. And this is especially true in the case of the Middle East, where a major initiative to hold a conference to discuss the establishment of weapons of uh, mass destruction uh, free zone seems to have uh, stalled. As far as the OPCW is concerned, we consider this, this initiative consistent with, the, with our own uh, objectives uh, for full universality and uh, have provided all possible support to the facilitator, the Finnish ambassador, the undersecretary, uh, Ambassador Laiava. Uh, as regards the future direction of our work more broadly, uh, our state parties, uh, the global chemical industry, and various other stakeholders within our membership need to remain fully engaged in order to trade a path that will strengthen the global ban on chemical weapons. Our goals need to be retooled to contemporary and future security needs. It took a hundred years to reach a point where nations agreed to a total prohibition on CWs and to destroy their stockpiles. And maintaining this prohibition uh, will require uh, a continuation of a collective effort under the terms of the Convention and the guidance provided by the policy-making organs, our work includes inspections at commercial uh, chemical plant sites. Uh, 2, 200 such inspections uh, were uh, conducted so far uh, in almost uh, uh, nearly 5,000 <coughs> declared sites uh, worldwide. We also monitor imports and exports uh, of designated chemicals. Uh, we identify discrepancies between those declarations and uh, reconcile them uh, with concerned state parties. We carry out assist and protection uh, capacity building activities for emergency response. Uh, we promote knowledge sharing and the peaceful use of chemistry. We also productively engage with the global chemical industry, the scientific community and the public at large. In our present day world, the Convention offers a vanguard against the possible use of toxic chemicals. Progress towards accomplishing a major objective of the Convention, namely disarmament, sets the stage to consider how best its other core objectives can continue to be effectively served. 
Um, in the future, we will seek to make the convention better known amongst those who are not familiar with it. And uh, I must stress here that, uh, unfortunately, unlike uh, nuclear and, uh, and sometimes biological too, the Chemical Weapons Convention, the OPSW, are poorly known. Uh, and uh, some uh, actually uh, think that it's uh, due to its success, uh, victim of its own success, they say. I don't know if it's correct or not, but uh, the, the reality is that uh, it's not well known. Therefore, uh, this requires uh, additional efforts for public diplomacy uh, that we are trying to do. And this is, in fact, uh, in this context that I'm here today. Uh, and uh, there is also uh, a need to, to raise awareness among the relevant um, communities, like the scientific community, as well as the, um, uh, the, uh, the chemical industry. Uh, we have a scientific advisory board composed of 25 eminent experts from uh, different parts of the world. And they have taken a, uh, a more proactive role in this field. Uh, they have a temporary working group on uh, outreach and education, uh, which we appreciate. And we will uh, soon start implementing their recommendations in this respect. Uh, we have seen over the years uh, that uh, there is um, uh, the priorities of uh, states parties have changed, for instance, in view of the threat uh, driving from uh, non-state actors, uh, particularly terrorists, uh, uh, threat perceptions, uh, they, they have <coughs> more focused on capacity building for emergency response to uh, lower intensity uh, incidents. And uh, we provide support in this uh, context to states parties. We encourage them to establish regional and sub-regional centers we are also working closely with the European Union, which is in the process of establishing CVRN centers in different, uh, in different uh, regions. Um, the demand, uh, uh, actually, this led, led also us uh, to work more closely with the uh, chemical industry on chemical safety and security issues. Uh, we want uh, to do more in this context. Uh, that there is a clear requirement uh, by our states parties in this, uh, in this area. And uh, uh, the chemical uh, industry associations worldwide uh, will become a closer partner for us, uh, especially uh, in order to build such capacities with uh, s small and medium enterprises seems to be a challenge. Uh, more global uh, chemical industrial companies, of course, are much better equipped, but uh, the same cannot apply uh, to smaller ones. Therefore, we will uh, address together with the chemical industry associations uh, those uh, important issues. Uh, and many industry representatives, in fact, uh, do underline that the safety and security in the chemical field are um, <coughs> the two sides of the same coin. So there is a, uh, actually a merit uh, working together uh, with the organization in this, uh, uh, in this domain. Um, I think uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the fact that, um, in fact, the Secretary General of the United Nations um, attended for the first time a uh, uh, review conference last month uh, shows how far the organization has come in commending international recognition, uh, and which we appreciate. Uh, and. Uh, um, I mentioned the out outreach education that we will focus more. Uh, and finally, uh, let me say that uh, lessons of our accomplishments are, are important, not only for the future of our own regime, uh, but also hold relevance for international work on disarmament in general. And it's my hope that we can work together uh, with institutions such as the CSIS uh, to propagate the story of chemical weapons ban. Uh, which and then, and might engender hope and can inspire us collectively <coughs> in our quest for a better world. Thank you for your attention, and I'm prepared to take your questions and, uh, and speak more on uh, issues of common interest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have um, a full agenda of topics that we can cover. I would like to... Um, However, uh, introduce Dr. Cindy Vestergaard, um, who is um, my in-house expert <laughs> for a short mm -hmm. while. 
Cindy is a visiting fellow here at CSIS, and she is um, normally in Copenhagen with the Danish Institute for International Studies. We're working on a project together. Uh, she's been at the Danish Institute since 2007. Um, but before that, she was with the Canadian Department of Foreign Affairs, and uh, she has much more knowledge about chemical weapons than I may ever have. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would also like to bring your attention to this uh, recent publication that uh, you may have gotten as you walked in. Uh, Cindy wrote a short policy perspectives on um, a chemical weapons free Middle East. So. Cindy, I will give the floor to you for a bit and um, as a discussant, and then we will move to audience questions. Great, thank you so much, Erin, and thank you um, for your for your. First of all, actually, what I would like to do is kind of be another cheerleader for the uh, Chemical Weapons Convention in that this is a treaty that rocks. Uh, and it is not certainly well known that actually one of the things I think that shows how it rocks is that we're actually in the longest chemical piece that we've actually ever had, 25 years. But this raises the issue of Syria. So if we're in the potential situation where we have a non-state party uh, potentially breaking that peace, and now as you're saying that the advanced team is actually, I guess, disbanded and is no longer in Cyprus, what does that mean for the current situation and the ability for the international community to be able to respond to this, uh, to these allegations and the threat that unfortunately still exists today? Um, as uh, you, you might know, uh, the UN Secretary General has appointed um, head of mission, uh, an expert from Sweden, uh, early, uh, actually in mid-March, uh, no, late March, sorry. Uh, we received request on 20th March uh, from the Secretary General. I think the appointment was uh, made uh, a few days later. So th uh, this head of mission came to The Hague, to our organization. And he worked closely with uh, the other experts that we made available. There were three ex more experts from the WHO World Health Organization who came from Geneva. And uh, they, they prepared themselves for a deployment to, to Syria. And they advanced them to Cyprus, in fact, was uh, uh, aimed at this purpose, uh, which couldn't happen. And uh, at the moment, uh, this team is collecting information from different sources. Uh, I think they have been in contact with some um, states parties, uh, member states, and uh, <coughs> they may uh, also go to uh, neighboring countries if necessary, as I understood. They are working very independently. We don't interfere with their work, uh, and uh, they will, I'm sure, prepare a report for the UN Secretary General uh, later on, and, uh, uh, and I w they will uh, actually um, uh, you know, report what <coughs> they found out. But uh, it's unfortunate that uh, they, they didn't have the ability to go to the site and to interview, uh, in fact, the, the victims uh, and uh, to collect samples uh, and uh, with a view to analyzing them. Uh, we have a network of 22 designated laboratories uh, throughout the world which go through proficiency tests uh, every, every year and uh, which have the capability, in fact, to analyze the environmental samples like, like uh, clothes or, or other water, soil. Uh, but also, uh, we, are, uh, we have undertaken recently, three, uh, three years ago, um, in fact, uh, some contacts with uh, other laboratories, uh, they may not be the same, which are capable of uh, uh, carrying out analysis of uh, biosamples. So in investigation of alleged uses, uh, the latter is uh, extremely important, uh, having the ability to analyze <coughs> blood, urine, plasma, and others. Uh, therefore, we want to develop further this capability and establish a new network for those laboratories. There will be some overlaps, uh, but uh, they may not be the same uh, in certain cases. Uh, and uh, this will enhance our capability for the future. But at the moment, we have already made some arrangements with some of them in case we, uh, you know, the investigation team uh, does collect some samples and uh, uh, does require an analysis. So we have the team on standby, and the situation develops otherwise. Uh, they, they, are, uh, they will be ready to be deployed. Uh, they are well-trained um, experts uh, from different expertise, in fact. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so we are on a waiting mode now. 
So there sounds like there is still a, a mandate in the sense of trying to collect as much information in the meantime uh, as they can yes. surrounding the situation. That's right. Um, but that, of course, is also challenged by time, uh, the ability that time passes by to be able to get into the, into the zones. That's also correct. I mean, the, uh, we all know that the samples may, may degrade. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we may not have the ability, in fact, to find out uh, you know, from these analysis. Uh, but on the other hand, even uh, interviewing the uh, victims, uh, doctors, uh, the health uh, you know, issues, or collecting other information, um, pictures, uh, uh, so that, that, that could be useful. In terms of the, the larger discussion within the Middle East, if I can take it to also the, the issue of incapacitants and uh, riot control agents, uh, in the sense that we are witnessing not just the potential of allegations of chemical weapons use, but also uh, the potential misuse of, uh, of incapacitants and riot control agents, which I'll just, for lack of a better term, lump them together as incapacitants. And in, if maybe you could talk about what um, the results of the review conference were in looking at this area, which has a little bit of a loophole within the Chemical Weapons Convention, where we're actually in a situation where the soldier is actually protected against the use of these um, uh, agents in terms of uh, a method of warfare, but the civilian is not. So I'm wondering if you could maybe talk about what, in terms of looking at the, the OPCW moving from one of uh, destruction to maintaining uh, a chemical piece, how does incapacitance work within that area? Um, in the convention, uh, it was clearly stated uh, uh, that uh, the right control agents cannot be used as a method of warfare. Uh, so this is prohibited. And um, as to the uh, capacitant agents, uh, which may not be uh, you know, within the uh, category of uh, right control agents, and which are being used for law enforcement purposes for, by certain countries. Uh, according to some experts of service, uh, this is a loophole, as uh, you said. According to others, uh, these are covered, in fact, by the general purpose criterion, according to which uh, no state party has the uh, ability to use any toxic uh, uh, weapons uh, beyond uh, the uh, actually those uh, which are allowed uh, according to convention. So no country could uh, use uh, the, the such uh, uh, chemicals for uh, actually uh, still keep uh, or uh, for little purposes. Uh, but uh, this issue was discussed uh, during the review conference. There was, um, we were very close to an agreement to address this issue in the coming years. Uh, this didn't happen uh, at the time, but uh, this doesn't mean that uh, the issue will uh, will disappear from the agenda of the OPCW. I know that there are, uh, you know, there's a number of countries which are interested in uh, discussing this, and I think it's going to happen in the coming years. And um, I, I hope that there will be a common ground, in fact, to, uh, to take up the issue. Is there a method also, or, or a uh, sense of training in terms of how best to be able to use uh, incapacitants, uh, for example, not in enclosed spaces, or is there some type of tra training program that could happen, or um, that does happen? No, actually, we don't have any particular program uh, other than, uh, you know, uh, the uh, protection program. Uh, we uh, train the experts coming from uh, states parties, both in The Hague and as well as on a regional basis, uh, how to protect it themselves and, <coughs> of course, their people against the use of uh, uh, toxic chemicals uh, and um, how to use the, uh, you know, protective gears uh, uh, and uh, equipment how to identify the, um, the agent which might be used and how to protect them, how to counter uh, such, uh, such threats. Uh, but uh, we, we don't make any differentiation with the, between the, those uh, toxic chemicals and ICAs. Um, the other context within the Middle East is looking at the, uh, the custody, the security, uh, possession, and of course now we're looking at, at potential use. When in, in addressing chemical security issues um, with non-state actors, and you were talking about the role of, of global industry here, how can the states and industry work together? Is it, is it a need for better regulation, more legislation, or is there something else uh, that, uh, that can go from the bottom up, or certain mm -hmm. types, of, types of standards that need to be in place? Actually, um, global industry, um, chemical industry, doesn't want uh, any more regulations. They think that they have enough regulations, and which is correct. They are subject to different, um, you know, uh, controls. Um, they are part of uh, a responsible care program, uh, which relates also to 
chemical safety. Um, the, uh, but the, the, the purpose of such a cooperation, I think, uh, would not be to uh, develop new regulations uh, for, uh, for the uh, industry, but rather uh, build capacities where, where, wherever it's needed uh, together. Um, share some best practices to use the OPSW for uh, sharing best practices. Uh, in certain countries, in certain parts of the world, um, these kind of safety measures, security measures, are not uh, uh, you know, accurately, adequately uh, put in practice. So uh, we want to, to remedy this, which is in the interest of um, the, you know, uh, the uh, global community, the international community. So uh, any um, loophole in any part of the world in terms of chemical uh, safety and security may affect uh, others. Uh, no one, um, you know, no country is immune to such threats. Therefore, bearing this in mind, I think uh, it would be in the interest of uh, uh, all, all our states parties, 188, and we hope that it's going to increase in the near future, uh, will uh, we'll be engaged in this uh, uh, collective endeavor. Uh, we have about 84, 85 countries which declare uh, chemical plant sites uh, worldwide, um, and many others uh, do not have such declarable sites. Uh, nevertheless, we, we want to engage them. That's why we have this, uh, in fact, um, uh, international uh, cooperation on the peaceful use of chemistry, uh, which, is, uh, which constitutes a major um, incentive uh, for uh, the developing world. Uh, but they are important uh, to uh, implement uh, uh, the, the convention um, domestically uh, through a legislation uh, so that they can uh, monitor, for instance, uh, the imports, exports. Uh, these countries may be used for uh, dual use, uh, uh, you know, chemical uh, material transfers. Uh, so it's, uh, I think, in our common interest uh, to, uh, to, to get them on board. So all this uh, relates to, I think, uh, a closer cooperation uh, with the global chemical industry, in my view. Do I have time for one more? Sure, but can I ask a quick <laughs> And this is, uh, I hope, uh, in naivete, how, how is Taiwan handled? Oh, <laughs> that's tough question. As with, with, a, with a big chemical industry and not yeah. a party to. Uh, we, we have, um, as the UN has, uh, one China policy. So um, uh, China is, um, does represent um, um, you know, the chemical industry. They have, uh, they are the actually biggest um, uh, uh, country in terms of declarations of uh, chemical uh, industrial sites, so they declare about um, 1,500. Wow. Uh, nearly one third of declared sites worldwide. And, um, uh, but there is a, a cap for each state party. They, they don't receive more than 20 inspections per year. And uh, Taiwan is not covered uh, by, by this regime yet. So, um, yeah, this is a pending issue, I said. But, but they do declare. No. So, oh, they don't declare. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. I'll the end of my question. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very good one. Um, one of the things that was also there was, um, uh, there was a very seminal statement made about sea dumped weapons, uh, as I understand. And I think this is one of the things that maybe I should underscore uh, to the audience is that over the course of the 20th century, at least half a billion metric tons of chemical weapons were produced. And that's what makes this treaty so fantastic, in that uh, chemical weapons were certainly uh, horizontally and vertically proliferated. And a lot of this was dumped uh, into the seas. Uh, and maybe you could talk about the legacy that the OPCW can deal with when it comes to, to cleaning that up. Um, <coughs> sea dumped weapons are not covered by the Convention, by this regime. Um, but. Uh, when they come to the surface, of course, uh, the states parties may ask, uh, you know, uh, the support of the OPSW technical secretariat. We may send our experts to identify the, uh, the weapon, the munition, and uh, to help them how to handle it. And uh, with a view, of course, to uh, destroying it. Uh, having said that, uh, some states parties uh, had uh, shown an interest in addressing this issue within the OPSW. And recently, during the uh, review conference, uh, four countries, Baltic countries and uh, Nordic countries, 
uh, have raised this issue. And uh, there is a, a common understanding now that uh, states parties which are interested uh, may address the issue on a voluntary basis uh, within the OPSW, which will be used as a platform. So does it mean that uh, uh, the uh, OPSW will um, further in, be, will be further involved in this matter? Um, it's not yet clear. Uh, so it will depend on the outcome of those informal discussions that will be held. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. We um, will open the floor for questions. And we have two microphones, two roaming microphones. Um, Bonnie Jenkins, Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins. Good morning. I think it's up. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, this presentation. I think it's very good. And uh, thank you, uh, Director General Zunku, for coming here and speaking with us and doing this outreach uh, following the state's parties meeting that you had recently in The Hague. Um, I'm happy to hear about um, some of the uh, decisions that have been made and uh, conclusions regarding chemical safety and security. I think that's a, a strong step forward. And also happy to hear about some of the recognitions about the role of centers of excellence in working with existing centers and the importance of chemical security and safety um, regionally. Um, my question uh, uh, is in response to some of the comments you made about the chemical industry and chemical security and some of the things that might be needed um, in terms of what we can in increase in terms of chemical security. Um, I'm a uh, U.S. representative to the GA Global Partnership, which uh, you may know something about. It's a 25-member <coughs> partnership, um, which includes all the GA countries, but also includes a number of other countries like uh, Mexico, Denmark, Poland, Sweden, Switzerland, Norway, Belgium, Australia, for example. And we've been in existence, it's been in existence since 2002, and its main purpose is to fund projects to prevent WMD terrorism. Um, so a number of activities and projects that are funded by these countries are covered under the Global Partnership. Last year, we established in the Global Partnership a chemical safety and security sub-working group. And what this allows is for there to be a lot more focused um, funding and discussion on chemical safety and security. So it's a new group, and uh, the GP has only had one meeting so far. We'll have another meeting in early June. And so one of the issues that this new group is going to be looking at is what should it be funding in the area of chemical safety and security? What should be the areas of focus? What should be the regions that we should be um, uh, increasing attention and also increasing funding? Um, so I take on board what you said already about uh, what we can do in terms of the chemical industry. Um, they don't want a lot of uh, new regulations, but there's things that we can do, like sharing best practices, for example, and building capacity. So. Are there any other thoughts that you have in addition to those? I think those are good. Any other thoughts that, that, that you can think of in ways in which you can take advantage of this existing body of countries who are going to be looking at ways in which we can fund chemical safety and security in the future? Thanks. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Ambassador Jenkins. Uh, let me first uh, express my appreciation for the continuing support of yours uh, to the OPSW. And, uh, uh, we, we will uh, try to play an active role in this uh, group, uh, working group that you just mentioned. And we are in the process, in fact, uh, of developing some new ideas. Uh, I understand the next meeting will take place in London uh, uh, because the UK is the rotating chair. Uh, and uh, we, we will come up with some new ideas in this, uh, in this context. Clearly, we don't want uh, really uh, to, to, uh, to upset the chemical industry. We consider them as a... Um, as an important partner, they have been, uh, you know, involved in the development of the convention. So they, they have been involved in the negotiation of the convention for years, and uh, uh, we have had a continuous interaction since then uh, during the implementation phase. Uh, we are now uh, uh, in the process of uh, developing a mechanism uh, for, um, you know, more regular uh, interaction uh, with the chemical industry. Uh, the ICCA. Uh, seems to be the globally representative um, industry association. Um, but uh, Chinese and uh, Indians are not involved, so we want them also to be uh, represented in this mechanism uh, of interaction. Uh, what we want to do is uh, to develop certain programs uh, for capacity building in the chemical safety, uh, which 
uh, meet the expectations and the needs uh, of the industry. So uh, I think it's in their interest because, uh, 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 as I said earlier, the big companies, in fact, are well equipped, uh, but whereas the small and medium enterprises are not, so they cannot reach out to those uh, medium enterprises. Uh, therefore, we may be a partner, in fact, uh, to do it uh, in the coming years uh, in, in jointly. So that's uh, how I see the niche, in fact, um, uh, area that uh, we should work together. But we will come up with uh, more concrete, uh, in fact, proposals for the June, before the June meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions here in the back? Ambassador uh, Christian I'm with Global Security Newswire. Uh, just a couple questions on the, the advanced team itself. Can you say when they left Cyprus and how the team had been broken down between uh, experts from the OBCW, uh, WHO, and perhaps other uh, organizations? Actually, we, we had uh, several experts on the ground, uh, so they changed. And the idea was not really to uh, conduct any work there, but to prepare the ground for the deployment of the uh, larger team if uh, it happened, uh, which didn't happen. So uh, recently, we had one expert from the OBCW and another expert from the UN, in fact, uh, who was involved in the planning. So there were two, and they were withdrawn, I guess, uh, a week ago. Uh, Just beginning of this week. Hey, all right, so, yeah, beginning of this week. Okay. Dr. Amy Smithson. Thank you for joining us today. I'm going to return to the topic du jour, which is, of course, Syria. Um, obviously, it's not exactly clear what has happened. We don't have all the facts. We're not sure what has been used definitively, much less who might have been using it. Everybody can make their own guesses here. But uh, it seems to me like there is a quandary about what to do and how to prevent future use. And there are a number of options that are being discussed in Washington, whether it's establishing a no-fly zone, which wouldn't actually take care of missiles or rockets, uh, or uh, maybe swooping in to secure the stockpile or trying to bomb it. Uh, the, do you know whether or not you've got it all is one of the questions there. And might you release toxic clouds over civilian populations with bombing or trigger al-Assad's threat to use chemical weapons in the event of foreign inter intervention with uh, an attempt to secure the stockpile? So there are a lot of things being discussed, all with serious drawbacks. The reason I'm going to ask you this question is because it falls underneath of the aegis of the Chemical Weapons Convention. And that is, what about defenses? The treaty has a provision that all members are obligated to provide assistance in the event that another country is threatened by the use of chemical weapons or undergoes a chemical weapons attack. In this case, clearly the drawback is Syria is not a member, but we have a um, a, a humanitarian crisis uh, that could explode exponentially if chemical weapons are used or any chemical, toxic chemical, is used in, in a widespread fashion. And I wonder if you thought there was some advantage to providing defenses to the, si the Syrian civilians as well as to the Free Syrian Army in these circumstances, because 188 countries have made that pledge. <laughs> Um, <coughs> uh, thank you, uh, Amy, for these comments. And in fact, uh, um, your comments uh, do raise several questions. Uh, let me pick up some of them. Um, since the Syrian crisis um, began in March uh, 2011, uh, as the technical secretary, in fact, uh, we uh, addressed several scenarios. And uh, one of the scenarios, for instance, was uh, the possibility that uh, states parties uh, neighboring Syria uh, may feel the threat of use of chemical weapons, especially after the July uh, statement last year by uh, the Syrian spokesman, uh, and uh, may request some assistance from uh, the organization and states parties under Article 10 of the uh, Convention. Uh, so what uh, we, we should do. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this, this didn't happen, but uh, this could have happened. And uh, in such a case, of course, the requesting state party have, has to substantiate the, the uh, perceived threat uh, and uh, uh, should make clear what uh, it needed in terms of uh, uh, protection. 
uh, what kind of equipment, what kind of expertise, and so on. And um, uh, we would uh, have the mandate to coordinate uh, such an assistance. Uh, and we, we made, uh, you know, we undertook some uh, exercises, tabletop exercises within the Secretary uh, to be in order to review our procedures and to be f fully prepared uh, for uh, responding to such requests. Uh, as to the um, population, uh, ci civilians living in Syria, which uh, may feel the same threat, we don't have such a mandate as the OPSW to address uh, those questions. Uh, but um, uh, clearly the United Nations, in fact, uh, the UN agencies uh, which provide humanitarian assistance and others uh, have a global uh, mandate. And um, uh, if they requested some um, support from the OPSW uh, for uh, the, these scenarios, they could always ask our uh, expertise, which didn't happen. But uh, I think uh, uh, in that case, I would need, in fact, a, a decision by the policy-making organs uh, of the organization to provide uh, uh, such a support. Uh, we don't know uh, who used what, as you said. and. Um, a, we don't have the ability to, to, to verify it. And, um, uh, but what is important from my point of view uh, is the serious threat uh, that, uh, that pose those uh, chemical weapons stockpiles, which are reported to be up to uh, 1,000 uh, metric tons, which is a considerable stock, uh, dispersed throughout the country and of all kinds of uh, chemical weapons. So as long as they continue to exist, uh, they pose uh, such a uh, safety and security uh, threat. And um, I, of course, one would wish that these weapons uh, would be uh, under control uh, earlier uh, and uh, be uh, you know, uh, addressed with a view to destroying them. Uh, let's hope that uh, this issue uh, will be addressed, for instance, uh, at the um, uh, upcoming and uh, hopefully uh, planned uh, conference uh, to be held in Geneva, and uh, to, uh, you know uh, the uh, uh, more pressure we put on the uh, Syrian regime on on this issue. What I welcome uh, is that the international community, as a whole, seem to be uh, united on on this issue. Uh, although they may have different positions with regard uh, to Syria and its future. I think on the uh, possession of chemical weapons, on the use of chemical weapons, they seem uh, to be uh, unified and uh, opposed uh, to, to, to any use of them. Additional questions on this side of the room? Sure. Great. Thank you for being here, Mr. Director General. My name is Andrew Kerjok. I work for Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, which is a Department of Energy site out in the other Washington, uh, eastern Washington. Uh, my question is about uh, inspections, particularly on other chemical production facilities. I know that the OPCW uses statistical methods uh, to determine where they visit, but is there a role for open source information from the internet or social media either in feeding into the statistics or once sites have been selected in maybe targeting down the inspections themselves? Um, we have a selection methodology based on certain criteria, but which is still interim uh, because there is no uh, consensus yet amongst these parties on one criterion which is not yet defined. Therefore, we have developed a software uh, which selects uh, 200, nearly 240 sites to be uh, inspected on a yearly basis by our inspectors. And one of the criteria, for instance, is uh, to uh, select the most relevant sites uh, uh, above a certain uh, level of production of certain chemicals. Uh, but we want also to ensure as, uh, you know, equitable geographical distribution. Uh, there, there are countries which do not declare more than a limited number of uh, sites. Uh, so we want to uh, keep a reasonable uh, interval uh, uh, between two inspections to those countries. Uh, in certain cases, it happened to be 15 years, which is uh, very, um, uh, you know, long, 10 years. So we want to uh, reduce it uh, to six to seven years, even if one country, uh, for instance, declared one site. As to the use of uh, uh, open sources, our inspectors, before going to those uh, 
sites. Um, they, uh, of course, uh, have access, to, to, for instance, to the website of um, uh, the, 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 a particular uh, company which uh, they uh, study. And um, uh, they may use uh, some other open sources. But uh, uh, for the preparation of, um, uh, sorry, for the identification of uh, sites to be inspected, uh, we don't have the uh, mandate um, to uh, use such sources. Some states' parties are opposed to it. <coughs> Uh, and they, uh, they argue that uh, only the declarations can uh, provide a basis uh, for the uh, declarable sites. So we follow this line. Uh, we cannot identify, for instance, some chemical sites which, should, which could be declarable, but which are not declared by states parties using open sources. So we don't have this mandate. Thank you. Uh, my name is Galal Samadisi. I work at uh, CRDF Global, and our organization implements various programs uh, to promote international science collaboration. Um, kind of to, to piggyback off Ambassador Jenkins' question, the awareness of chemical safety and security, perhaps at the university level, not even at the, in addition to the industry level, have you seen throughout you know, the developing world that there's you know, an understanding of a nuance between chemical safety, which I would you know, assert, uh, you know, unintentional misuse uh, versus chemical security, which would be, uh, you know, uh, intentional misuse. And do you think kind of inculcating a culture of chemical security at the university level, at the postgraduate level, um, can kind of, in the future, um, you know, promote a culture of uh, chemical weapon nonproliferation um, in the long term? Thank mm -hmm. you. I, I think uh, you have very well defined uh, the ultimate goal of ours, <laughs> uh, and uh, you're right, uh, there might be some accidental use, and uh, which needs, of course, an effective response. Uh, but the uh, uh, primary objective should be uh, to raise awareness about the risks associated uh, by handling these um, chemicals uh, and uh, preventing any access to them, uh, for instance, by uh, terrorists and others. And, uh, uh, also, uh, to ensure uh, some uh, basic, uh, you know, security, uh, physical security measures uh, in all those uh, sites. Um, this, this uh, again, uh, requires a very wide, uh, uh, you know, collective effort. Uh, the uh, ICCA, uh, as the global uh, association, in fact, uh, does promote uh, such measures and. Um, uh, they they uh, they promote also the uh, uh, you know membership to the chemical weapons convention uh, as one of the criteria. In fact, uh, to be member to the uh, to their own association, I think for the future uh, they may do a little more. For instance, by uh, promoting the uh, investors, possible potential investors in the developing world, uh, to pay more attention to safety. Um, measures and uh, to safety um, awareness raising as well as uh, capacity building. Uh, I think that this is an area that we could uh, do more um, uh, collectively. Dan and then Paul. Hello, I'm Dan Horner from Arms Control today. I had a couple of questions about the uh, proposed UN inspection and the passage of time. Um, if you just give a little more detail about what is and is not possible to be found at this point. Cause, for example, I've heard that uh, there has been, there's been serious degradation. Um, it now it might be possible to find some things, but you would need much more precise information about the locations to get to it. Is that your understanding as well? Um, and then secondly, in addition to the point that you, that you made about being able to interview uh, victims and doctors, is there a political value in having the team go in, even if they aren't able to find out a lot, is to establish a precedent for future situations like this? Thanks. Um, I, I think um, in some statements uh, uh, by the UN officials, it was made clear that the uh, team's mandate would be um, to identify uh, what was used rather than who used. Um, uh, and um, 
which, which didn't happen clearly, but uh, they would focus on uh, the chemicals which might be used. Uh, and uh, as to this serious degradation of samples, uh, our experts uh, told me that um, in certain cases, for instance, for environmental samples, um, the, the, uh, in fact, the, the degradation would be quicker, uh, whereas for biosamples, uh, some in-depth analysis could help identify any uh, possible chemical uh, after a certain period of time, depending on the chemical. But uh, uh, so the time might, may not be that short as uh, something, for instance, a week or two weeks, but uh, it may be a little longer. I, I cannot, uh, you know, give you a, a definite, um, a precise answer on that, but uh, I, I'm told that um, it can go up to a month, sometimes two months, uh, two. Um, for as to the uh, setting a precedent, uh, you, you may know that uh, the such investigations, in fact, were held in the past before the establishment of the OPSW uh, under the uh, mandate of the under the auspices of the UN Secretary General, based on a Security Council resolution as well as a UN uh, General Assembly resolution. And, um, uh, and the teams were uh, composed of, uh, uh, on an ad hoc basis uh, by, uh, by experts. And uh, these uh, investigations, such investigations, in fact, uh, were conducted sometimes months later than the uh, alleged incidents of, of use. So there are already some uh, precedents, uh, if you wish, uh, on the, uh, in the UN context. Uh, this is the first time that OPSW, since uh, its establishment in 1997, uh, that was, uh, it was called uh, you know, to support a fact-finding mission. And um, we, of course, one would hope that everything went smoothly and we would be able to deliver what we were, we were expected to deliver. Uh, but if it, it didn't happen, uh, clearly, uh, I think um, we, the OPSW should not be held responsible for that. Uh, we are a technical organization. We are making available our technical uh, resources, capabilities, and uh, all the rest, which are political, are being uh, addressed somewhere else. So that's uh, what I can say. Paul Bernstein from National Defense University. Thanks for your remarks, sir. Uh, sticking with Syria, I'd like to just pose a hypothetical to you and get your reaction to it. Um, let's assume for a moment that at some point a friendly government emerges uh, in Syria. Um, can you envision the OPCW assisting such a government um, in tasks such as securing and inventorying the CW stockpile it holds if it has yet to make a clear commitment to joining the CWC? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think... Um, we have the mechanisms uh, already in place within the OPSW uh, to provide assistance uh, to states which are not party, uh, but uh, with a view to preparing them for uh, membership. We do it, for instance, at the moment with Myanmar, uh, with Angola. We proposed uh, the same to South Sudan and Somalia. Uh, these four countries, in fact, uh, I, uh, closer the, the, than the other four, if you wish, uh, uh, from our point of view, to full membership. And we, we sent some experts to those countries uh, and uh, to inform them about the, uh, their obligations, uh, but also uh, you know, uh, to prepare for, uh, for instance, their legislation, national legislation, and, uh, uh, and also the uh, mechanisms they need for uh, implementation, domestic implementation. Each uh, state party has the obligations to set up a national authority, which would be responsible for the coordination of, um, uh, among different agencies, uh, for uh, the coordination of the implementation of the convention. So this involves the customs and others. Uh, so that uh, requires a lot of work. So this kind of assistance and support uh, could clearly be provided to, <coughs> to Syria too. And um, uh, as to the identification of weapons, um, uh, and security of them. Uh, of course, we have such an expertise. Uh, I think if uh, you know, uh, it comes uh, uh, from Syria, or uh, what, I mean, without speculating on, the, on its future, uh, I think we have the uh, necessary resources to do it. 
uh, if uh, there is a Security Council resolution or if there is a, a decision by the uh, states parties, um, um, by the Executive Council or Conference of States Parties, I think we would be ready to, to do it. So, a question in the center. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Andrew Turner from the UK. Um, could you expand a little bit on what the OPCW might be doing in terms of preventing physical proliferation from Syria, either in respect of forensic analysis at border crossing points or likely rat runs into neighboring states, or what other support you might be providing to neighboring states to prevent the development of a spillover or wider problem set outside of Syria? Um, we, we don't have the capability uh, to go to the border areas and um, uh, to monitor uh, the transfers of uh, any uh, toxic uh, chemical material uh, from one country to another. Uh, but we have some training programs, in fact, uh, where we hire some uh, experts and uh, try to build such a capacity. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if there were transfers uh, to a state party uh, of chemical weapons, uh, there are mechanisms which may be involved, um, like challenge inspection, because um, uh, it's uh, strictly prohibited to uh, bring in import or transfer chemical weapons to any uh, state party. Uh, therefore, they have the obligation to prevent it. If it wasn't, uh, then other state parties may invoke uh, the challenge inspection mechanism, and we will have the obligation, uh, which may be hardly prevented, they would this would require two-thirds majority by the Executive Council to prevent the, uh, you know, um, conduct of such an inspection. Therefore, it's uh, uh, nearly, uh, you know, an automatic mechanism uh, which would be in put in place. Then we would send our experts and verify the situation on the ground and uh, make a report, in fact, to, uh, to the Executive Council. So challenge inspection mechanism, I think, um, is the, um, Right, would be the right mechanism to be uh, invoked if such transfers uh, are uh, allegedly taking place. Do we have additional questions from the floor? I'm going to just take my prerogative then as the chair <laughs> to go back to some other issues. You mentioned um, on destruction that the U.S. was had destroyed about 90 percent. Yes. Um, how is Russia doing <laughs> on that score? And could you just give us a sense? I know there are a lot of experts in the room, but I'm not an expert. Why does it take so long um, for the destruction of these chemicals? What are the major factors that uh, cause this? I don't, I don't want to call it a delay, but to, to make it take so long. <coughs> Uh, in, let me begin with Russia. Um, mm -hmm. Russia has uh, declared seven um, different uh, storage sites, and um, yeah, they reached a level of 72.3% uh, of destruction recently, um, and uh, they finished in <coughs> uh, two of them. Uh, four others are at the moment operational, uh, and one other is going to become operational by the end of this year. Uh, and uh, one of the issues, of course, that is that those chemical weapons cannot be transported. Uh, this is prohibited by law in the United States. They cannot be transported from one state or another. And uh, the same applies in Russia. Therefore, the chemical plant destruction sites had to be built next to the storage sites. Uh, if the other option was, uh, you know, um, was made available uh, appropriate, so that, that could, of course, uh, uh, simplify the matter. And uh, certain, cate certain categories of uh, weapons could be assembled in certain sites, and uh, with one technology, with one uh, plant, and so on, everything could be destroyed um, uh, there, which didn't happen. And um, in the case of Russia, I think, um, uh, although they received a lot of support from uh, other states' parties, uh, both technologically and um, uh, in terms of funding too. Um, there were some uh, you know, initial difficulties in the uh, 90s and uh, uh, later uh, they were able to overcome 
and some technical problems uh, with regard to certain uh, munitions, certain weapons. Uh, now they seem to be on uh, right uh, on the on track, and uh, they they make a steady uh, progress, uh, which I welcome. But they were not able to to meet the deadline. Um, in the case of uh, the United States, um, uh, among the nine sites, uh, so they finished in um, uh, seven uh, sites, uh, and. Uh, uh, two others are being built, as I said earlier, in Colorado and um, in Kentucky. Uh, in Colorado, the, the construction is um, almost complete. Uh, uh, and in uh, Kentucky, it's 67%, uh, 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 and which will require a few more years. Uh, one of the uh, actually issues is uh, the safety. Uh, the safety comes first, and, um, and this requires also a lot of testing. Um, for instance, systemization, as they call it, uh, which uh, includes testing of uh, each equipment, which includes the training of uh, the personnel who will handle uh, those equipment. Um, it, it, it does uh, need uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of time. And uh, in Pueblo, uh, the systemization is likely to continue for the next two, two and a half years. Uh, and uh, once uh, they will be uh, sure about safety, then uh, the uh, plant will become operational. This is quite a dangerous, uh, in fact, operation, labor intensive in each site. 1,000 people work. And uh, a, for each site, and increasingly more, uh, it, it's, uh, there, was, uh, there was a need for um, close interaction with local communities, which were concerned about the environmental effects uh, of this um, you know, destruction activity. And um, in the case of Pueblo and, um, uh, and uh, Kentucky, uh, because of the insistence of local, local communities, the incineration um, methodology could not be applied, so they had to develop another technology uh, of neutralization. Uh, there are more technical words that I, I don't want to use here, but uh, uh, anyhow, that, that, that uh, actually uh, prolonged uh, the whole process. Uh, but uh, I think uh, among the state parties, there was never a question about the commitment of uh, you know, major possessive states, uh, Russia and the United States. Uh, clearly, they asked for more transparency, and according to a decision taken um, two years ago, uh, one and a half year ago now, at the end of <coughs> 2011, at the Conference of State Parties, uh, state parties, possessive state parties, US, Russia, as well as uh, Libya, were allowed to continue the distraction uh, and to, to complete it in the shortest time possible. That's the formulation uh, which was agreed. And uh, with more transparency, so with more regular uh, reporting. And uh, they tasked me also, as Director General, to monitor the situation. And based on independent um, uh, sources from our inspectors, make an evaluation uh, and make a report to the policy-making organs and uh, report to them whether they are on track, whether they, are, uh, they have taken all necessary measures to accelerate uh, the process of destruction or not. So this reporting, uh, you know, uh, quite, um, I should say, um, uh, regular and strict reporting uh, process is underway. And uh, uh, also, the, so is the destruction. Uh, but this will require uh, a few more years. Uh, the Russians have identified the planned completion date uh, the end of 2015. Um, we will see whether they will be able to, uh, this is an internal uh, plant completion date, which was approved also by policymaking organs. Um, and uh, in the case of the uh, United States, this goes up to uh, 2022, I guess. Uh, again, for the reasons that I uh, just explained. Uh, but we hope that uh, also the US is going to be able to finish a little earlier. <laughs> that, uh, uh, the, the boss who runs the whole, the whole program, <laughs> Andy Weber. Can I actually follow up on that? And I think that this is actually an extremely important uh, question you've asked and, and, and uh, the challenges that you're talking about. Because when we're talking about potential nuclear disarmament, I think this is always one of the interesting things where you're here, oh, we need to do it in the next 20 years, 10 years. And I think that the... Um, the experience of chemical weapons destruction, not just in terms of the international 24 years to negotiate the treaty, 
but then also the time that it takes for each country that possesses to go through the natural uh, process that it has to in terms of talking to its communities that have uh, are going to be undergoing or, or close to uh, destruction facilities such as you just mentioned what are the laws already in place mm -hmm. in the different countries but are there other examples that um, that because of the success of the CWC and we're actually moving towards chemical zero that could in some way offer lessons for some of the other WMD aspects? I think there is. Um, and uh, some, in fact, uh, observers um, uh, thought that um, uh, similar um, you know, programs uh, could be uh, emulated in and applied to, to the intradismuth and to, the, um, to a possible nuclear disarmament process. Um, for instance, the verification mechanism. Uh, I think uh, uh, there are lessons to be drawn uh, from uh, the uh, CWC verification mechanism uh, in the future, uh, and uh, uh, both uh, the, to the, the training of experts and um, you know the modalities of uh, receiving uh, such inspections uh, and uh, developing the national legislation in order to receive uh, such uh, these inspectors. Uh, so that uh, and ma many others, in fact. Uh, so. Uh, I think uh, if uh, we come to that stage, and uh, we welcome, of course, uh, the um, you know statement made by um, President Obama in Prague. So if we, we come to that stage, I think um, uh, we we would uh, I mean many many observers experts would draw on the CWC experience, and uh, we'll find uh, many um, elements that can be actually used to, for nuclear disarmament. I think we have one more question before we let you go. <laughs> I'm Aaron Gluck from CNS. I was wondering, in regards to small to medium-sized enterprise engagement, is there a desired outcome from that engagement, whether it's joining the Responsible Care Initiative or if they're not comfortable joining RC, if it's creating codes of conduct, switching from more toxic chemicals to using safer practices, is there a certain outcome that you're looking for? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> on, on the code of conduct, in fact, uh, this is an issue that we want to uh, explore, uh, not only with regard to chemical industry, but uh, uh, with regard to scientific community as well. There have been some attempts, attempts on a national basis, and some uh, states parties had already done it. Uh, they developed some codes of conduct. We want to, uh, you know, uh, to provide a forum uh, for sharing such uh, uh, practices, best, uh, best practices uh, with others. Uh, and this is extremely important uh, from my point of view um, because uh, uh, not only, uh, you know, um, verification measures, uh, import export controls uh, would be, uh, uh, you know, would lead us to the desired uh, uh, outcome and um, uh, ultimate goal of uh, ensuring and the non-proliferation of those weapons and prevention of their uh, re-emergence. In addition to all this, uh, uh, we would need uh, the awareness raising, as I said earlier, and um, education of uh, those communities. It's in this context, I believe, that uh, we have to educate also the small and medium uh, enterprises. Uh, and uh, we, we have to engage them. Um, how to do it, it will depend, I believe, uh, it will vary from one country to another. It will depend of, uh, also uh, on their responsiveness. In some countries, um, uh, the states parties uh, believe that uh, we should interact with the chemical industry through their national authorities, which we will do. I mean, uh, they will uh, be the, um, uh, you know, the focal point, if you wish, who will organize uh, such an uh, interaction. But I think. Uh, uh, they realize also that it's in their interest, in the interest of the uh, government agencies, uh, that uh, the, uh, their own industry becomes um, you know, more capable uh, and uh, more aware of the, the security risks and safety risks. Um, and um, I, I think uh, this would also help some developing countries, in fact, to become more prepared to receive uh, this kind of investments. So that might be also an incentive uh, for them uh, to develop such capacities and uh, uh, to uh, express their readiness um, uh, through their uh, such capacities to receive more uh, investments. 
the uh, chemical industry investments have considerably shifted from Western countries to, uh, to Asia, for instance, mm -hmm. over the past 15 years. Uh, the Asian countries do host now, I guess, uh, almost 50% of the chemical industry globally. Well, Mr. Zumchu, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank we you. really appreciate your taking the time while you're here in Washington, D.C. You have a very important job, and um, we wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank Please, you very much. Uh, join me.